Hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. My name is Kathy Hoverman. I'll be moderating the webinar today from, uh-oh, we got a dog in the house here, uh, from ASE Environmental and Water Resources Institute and AFS Bioengineering Sections Joint Committee on Fisheries Engineering and Science. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on our YouTube channel. The series began in 2015 to share information of aquatic organism passage, dam removal, fisheries improvement, and community and stakeholder engagement and the related topics. <clears throat> Since the inception, we've been providing free quarterly webinars with today's being the very first in our 2023 series. Um, as we move through the webinar today, please feel free to use the chat box to drop in questions at any time, but we will hold the questions until the end of the webinar presentation. Uh, so you can find some of our prior e uh, webinars and sign up on our email list on our um, on our website. Uh, that address is off to the, the right side on the, the view here. Uh, we also do more than webinars. If you're interested in becoming a part of our joint committee or serving on a variety of task committees or even joining the executive committee, um, please feel free to reach out to the current executive committee that's listed on the page here, um, we, we need new people, uh, new energy and new ideas. So please, please join us. Uh, another item to note is that the expressions of interest to host a future Fish Passage Conference for 2024, 25 or 26 are all due to the Conference Steering Committee tomorrow, February 24th. If uh, you represent a group or an institution or have a some kind of um, group, that would make an uh, awesome location for the conference. We'd love to have your application in. Um, please reach out to the steering committee um, members, Laura or Elsa, to get a little more information or submit your application. <clears throat> the, um, as a service to practitioners and decision makers in the practice of fish passage and river restoration, especially those new to the field, the American Fishery Society BES Education Committee is rolling out two new products this spring. And um, the first one is a training portal. It's being set up to serve as a first stop shop for trainings and in the areas of practice of, uh, that we mentioned. And the purpose of this portal is to house a user-friendly compilation of links to available training. If you conduct or know a training you would like to add, there will be a link for submitting your contribution um, once that portal is online. Additionally, the other item is that the BES Education Committee is rolling out a grouping of checklists to aid in executing a civil work project for improving fish passage or habitat from inception to completion. This will help a project proponent move in a deliberate and methodical manner through the steps of pre-design, design, construction, and post-construction to reduce missteps and backtracking. So both of those will um, also hopefully be a part of our webinar series so we can get a little more information out to everyone and, uh, and share that with you all. If you were at our last webinar, you know that we've got our entire webinar 2023 series already laid out. So these folks are on the menu for this year and we have half of our 24 slate also assigned. So let's talk about today. Today we have Beth Lambert. Beth is the director of the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration or DER. Her background and training are in fluvial geomorphology with early career work in watershed-based restoration in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. After moving to New England, she developed expertise in dam removal and salt marsh restoration. Beth has been with DER since its inception in 2009, and in 2018, she became the director of the agency and is currently leading the DER through a period of growth. The DER and partners have removed over 60 dams and restored over 4,000 acres of wetlands since 2009. Today, Beth is speaking about DER's approach to aquatic ecosystem restoration and how the agency builds program support within and outside of state government to sustain and expand restoration in Massachusetts. Beth, welcome. We're excited to learn from you and DER, so please take it away. 
Thank you. Just give me a moment to share my screen here. Okay, Kathy, are you seeing that? Yes, all good. Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have a chance to talk with you. And I wanna thank the committee very much for inviting me to speak today. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, how our Division of Ecological Restoration, which is a small agency in the Department of Fish and Game in Massachusetts, has been building and sustaining a state government approach to restoration. And what I will be covering um, is a little bit of background on ecological restoration and state government in Massachusetts. I'll talk about um, our division's um, niche and our role in leading and supporting river and wetland restoration across the state. I'll touch on the lessons that we've learned over the last 14 years in how to sustain a small state agency that is dedicated solely to ecological restoration. And then I'll talk about our vision for the future. So I'm gonna start uh, with a little bit of history of restoration in Massachusetts. And um, the division that I lead, Division of Ecological Restoration, is very young in state government. We were formed in 2009 by the administration at the time and the leaders of several agencies in order to really bring attention, momentum, um, and raise the visibility of restoration in the state of Massachusetts. That came after a 10 year period of sort of growth of interest in aquatic habitat restoration in Massachusetts. So in the early 2000s, um, that was when salt marsh restoration really gained momentum and strength in Massachusetts. And that work was led by a small program called the Wetland Restoration Program, um, which was housed within our state's Department of Environmental Protection and then within the Coastal Zone Management Office. In 2002, the administration, the state administration created a state office of aquatic ecosystem restoration. Uh, that was very short lived because that was promptly eliminated um, the following year. Also around that time, um, around 2003 or so, dam removal became um, a topic of interest and, um, and something that many folks across the Commonwealth wanted to initiate and support. And so some of the first dam removals took place in the mid 2000s. And those were led by a small group called the Riverways Group, um, which was located in a completely different agency from the Wetlands Restoration Program. So, as salt marsh restoration was really gaining strength and um, you know, dozens of projects were underway, that was when dam removal started to gain strength as well. And so around 2005, state government formed an internal working group to consider how best to leverage and support ecological restoration in the state, specifically aquatic habitat restoration. Um, that task force came out with a series of recommendations, you know, which included having a state agency or a state office that was dedicated to restoration. And so finally, in 2009, these leaders merged together that wetlands program, which had been leading salt marsh restoration, and the rivers program, which was in a completely different agency, um, but was leading river restoration. And the goal was really to highlight, bring attention to restoration, and to have a single source of resources that could lead restoration projects and support projects across the state. So where that um, division is now, which is the Division of Ecological Restoration, we are housed within the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game. We're one of several divisions within Fish and Game Fish and Game, meanwhile, sits underneath 
the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, which is the Secretariat level office. Um, and all the environmental agencies are underneath that umbrella, as well as energy related agencies. So um, we are housed within Department of Fish and Game, but we collaborate with agencies you know, across the state. So now I'm gonna share a little bit about how we do our work as a state agency and how that fits into sort of the larger landscape of restoration in Massachusetts. So the Division of Ecological Restoration's mission is to restore and protect rivers, wetlands, and watersheds for the benefit of people and the environment. We carry out um, that mission in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, one of the most important aspects of our division is that we are completely non-regulatory. We don't oversee um, game fish, inland fish. We don't oversee uh, marine fish. We don't enforce any environmental regulations. So we are essentially free to direct our own work to achieve our mission in whatever way that we see fit. And that is an extraordinarily unusual situation for a state agency. The way that we carry out our restoration work is um, we work in partnership with others. So we work with federal agencies, state agencies, local and statewide nonprofit organizations, landowners, and municipalities all across the state. Our division provides um, project management essentially for high value aquatic habitat restoration projects. Um, local leads can, or local project owners essentially apply to the division through a competitive process. And we select projects that bring high ecological benefits and high benefits to people. And selected projects then become eligible for staff project management assistance, direct one-on-one -on -one assistance, fundraising assistance, training, um, grants when we have them available. We also um, provide engineering services through a group of pre-qualified engineering firms. And so in summary, we are essentially working in the trenches with communities and local partners to plan and carry out restoration projects. We do provide grants um, you know, as we are able to, but our primary strength is in that um, project management and partnership-based approach. This results in building a strong pipeline of vetted projects that have been through feasibility, design and permitting, and are perfectly positioned for construction funding through the larger federal grant programs and other state large grant programs. Um, so that's how we do our work in summary and um, the niche that we fill. And so um, in essence, you know, we lead restoration, we support others doing restoration, and then we share the knowledge that we've gained through that project management with others that need it to lead and support projects. We rely on strong internal operations. Um, and then most importantly, we rely on reliable and steady funding and the support of the community, the restoration community at large, whether that is landowners, municipalities, or major non-governmental organizations. And I'll come back to that um, towards the end because that's really how we are able to maintain and sustain an agency that's dedicated to ecological restoration. Um, this is a picture um, of our staff. Um, we have incredibly dedicated and talented staff. And um, that is probably our number one uh, most important thing that we're able to bring to restoration. So these staff are the ones who are working, you know, in the trenches with municipalities and others 
to lead and support restoration around the state of Massachusetts. Our work focuses on um, major stressors and needs. And we think of this in terms of what do our rivers and wetlands need to be healthy? And then what do our partners need to be successful in achieving their restoration goals? So through that sort of dual needs assessment, both assessment of ecological needs and habitat needs, and then assessment of our partners' needs, we um, have landed on, over time, landed on these um, areas of focus. Throughout all of this, we strive to be as nimble as possible. And so as new restoration needs um, arise or as our partners needs shift and change, we are responsive and, um, and try to be as proactive as possible in relation to those shifts. So right now, um, this is how we are carrying out our restoration work. We're focused on helping municipalities and others build capacity to replace undersized and failing culverts that are damaging habitat, blocking fish, um, preventing streams, um, chopping up stream networks into little segments. Um, so we're focused on helping municipalities build capacity to replace those undersized culverts with larger, safer structures. That approach includes incentive grants for municipalities, and then it also includes one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to municipalities and training. And so um, these pictures here show you an example of an undersized culvert that we worked with a town um, to replace by awarding incentive funding and providing technical assistance. And then the photo below that shows one of our training sessions for Department of Public Works staff that are charged with managing, managing roads and, um, and dealing with culverts within their communities. We also work on dam removal, coastal wetland restoration, and freshwater wetland restoration. And for that work, we take the project management approach that I discussed um, on the earlier slide. Those are the projects in which we're working um, closely with communities and others. We're helping them manage the projects. We're providing um, engineering services, meaning engineering services for design, for permitting, you know, for feasibility in the early stages. Um, and then we provide grants as funding allows. In general, up until uh, the present time, our division has not been a funding agency. Our budget has been small. And so our strength has been in that project management and in positioning projects for larger funding sources. Our budget for projects has increased significantly, however, over the last couple of years, um, culminating with receiving um, around $35 million in American uh, Recovery Plan Act uh, funds. So um, we are sort of wading into uh, a role as a funder and um, exploring how best to balance a role as a funder with our role as uh, technical assistance, project management, kind of that one-on-one -on -one project assistance role. We also are working to build the capacity of others to lead and support restoration. And um, we're particularly focusing on regional organizations. So watershed groups, regional planning agencies, regional and statewide nonprofit organizations. Those are organizations that are perfectly positioned to assist towns and landowners within their geographies um, and to provide the type of assistance that DER provides. As a small agency with a huge amount of demand for restoration assistance, we'll never, no matter how many staff we have, we'll never be able to meet that full need. And so our goal is to build the capacity of these other regional organizations so that they can step in and fill that same project management and technical assistance need in their regions um, that we do at the state level. 
So that includes providing grants for staffing so that those regional organizations can hire restoration coordinators. And then the technical assistance and tools and training and guidance needed to really help those organizations get up and running um, to be able to play a leadership role with restoration. And so through um, all of this, you know, and as I'm talking, sometimes I'll use the phrase we, and when I say we, I'm really referring to this broader restoration community, both our agency and then the partners that we work with. The, this um, slide shows you, you know, pictures of our staff and some of our partners. And so when we talk about working in partnership, we're really talking about DER staff, my division staff, um, working with these partners as a team across all levels of government and across organizations. And so when we're working in partnership, what we're really doing is we are uh, supporting, sharing goals, objectives, knowledge and information and resources back and forth among these various organizations and our staff and our division in order to accomplish whatever the restoration goal is. For us, this means, for DER specifically, this means building personal relationships with each other and with our partners so that we at the state know what our partners need in order to be successful. It means that DER and our partners um, are being flexible and adjusting to the needs of any given restoration project, playing different roles based on the needs of the project. So there's some projects, for example, where our division is, staff in our division are really leading a project and um, managing all aspects. There's other projects where the local lead has more capacity and so they're able to oversee engineering and design and permitting. And we just provide sort of guidance and assistance as we're going along. Um, we typically team up on public engagement um, but what it, it's basically our staff bringing whatever is needed to accomplish a restoration project, and then our partners at the local level each pitching in according to their skills and abilities and the need of the project as well. So using this model of teamwork and flexibility and essentially trying to do whatever is needed to get restoration projects done. Since we were founded in 2009, um, these are some sort of snapshots of what we've accomplished um, since then. So partnering with others, we've removed um, over 60 dams. Currently, again, working in partnership, we have um, around 60 river and wetland restoration projects and planning. We're able to implement and put on the ground, you know, and sort of complete around 10 restoration projects per year, um, including all the different types that I mentioned earlier. So culvert upgrades, dam removals, coastal wetland restoration, freshwater wetland restoration. We've opened around 300 river miles, uh, restored over 3000 acres of coastal wetlands. And we're currently undergoing an expansion from a division of 15 people, um, which is what we were from our inception until a couple of years ago, um, to 32 people. Right now, we're um, around 20 to 25 um, when we're fully staffed. Another accomplishment has been the economic output from our division's work. We did some studies on this um, around five to 10 years ago, and we learned that our leverage rate is um, anywhere from one to six to one to 12 on any given year. And so that means that for every dollar, every state dollar that we have in our budget to spend on projects, we're able to use that dollar to leverage anywhere from six to 12 additional dollars. And that comes from federal uh, largely from federal and from um, foundation grant sources. Our projects generate around a 75% return um, on their investment at the local level. 
And for every $1 million spent on restoration, that generates um, or supports 12 and a half full-time equivalents. We've also found that um, the average cost of removing dams and upgrading culverts um, is less expensive than repairing or replacing in kind um, over the lifetime of the structure. So the work essentially saves money in the long run. When you remove a dam, it saves the owner maintenance and um, repairs and inspections. And when you upgrade a culvert so that it's larger and more resilient to storms and better for habitat, then that saves the town money in emergency replacements and uh, maintenance. So I want to um, touch on briefly some of the sort of the challenges and the, um, the solutions, not solutions, but the sort of the tools and the techniques that our division has used to sustain itself um, since we were formed 14 years ago. So one of the challenges of, of having an ecological restoration agency is the perception that restoration of the environment is something that is nice to have, but not essential. And so the challenge that we have taken on over the last 14 years is to demonstrate to our stakeholders and to uh, legislators and to other decision makers that in fact, ecological restoration is not a nice to have activity. It's a need to have activity. And so the steps that we've taken and the, the tools that we've used to demonstrate that um, are what I'm gonna run through next. Um, so I think, you know, most importantly, currently is that you know, Massachusetts has had a growing awareness of the changing climate and impacts to communities from climate change, particularly storms and flooding. That awareness um, was not as significant when our division was formed, but it has been growing rapidly over the last, you know, five to eight years in the general public. And so we have worked really hard to demonstrate that aquatic habitat restoration projects, particularly dam removal, coastal wetland restoration, uh, freshwater wetland restoration, the, the projects that we take on are essential. They're an essential tool for helping people and communities adapt to climate change and to build resilience from the impacts of large storms um, and sea level rise. And, and that essentially, you know, using nature as an adaptation tool is a critical piece of the entire climate adaptation picture. So along with that, we have worked to really emphasize the benefits of restoration work, not just for nature, but for people. So we emphasize the cost savings um, of these projects. We emphasize the jobs that they bring to communities. We emphasize that many of our projects result in new protected open space um, which brings new recreation opportunities to communities. We emphasize the public safety benefits. And then as I was just saying, um, we have really positioned um, aquatic habitat restoration as a key part of the Commonwealth's climate adaptation strategy. So I think in summary, you know, these benefits are real and um, and yet they are not apparent to everyone. And so it's, critical, it's been crit critically important for us to examine our messaging and to think about um, who we're speaking with and what is most important to them and to meet people where they are in terms of what their community needs and what they as property owners um, or nonprofits or others you know, really need in relation to these projects. It's also been really important to us um, to build strong partnerships in the nonprofit community. And we have, uh, we're fortunate to have a strong network 
of nonprofits that are, you know, some are statewide, um, some are national, and some are local, where over the years of working together, we've developed a common restoration vision. And each organization sees how its mission and how its role can contribute to that, to that, um, that vision. So for example, um, one nonprofit may see its role as really advocating in the state legislature for funding and for policies that and creating the enabling conditions for restoration. Um, another may see its role as helping to build the capacity of other partners um, along with us to lead and support restoration. And so these strong alliances with non-governmental organizations have helped our division understand the needs of the restoration community and to build programs that truly support those needs. Um, it's a way of getting um, sort of ongoing and genuine feedback and guidance on how our division can best meet the needs of the public. And the more we do that, the more that that in turn um, is reflected in support in the legislature and in the community for our work. And so that has really resulted in um, strong funding for our division over the last few years. Um, we also work to be nimble in relation to changes in the restoration landscape itself, changes in needs, for example, Currently in Massachusetts, uh, we have a small cranberry industry and many cranberry growers are, um, are retiring from that industry. And there's a shift in the industry where the cranberry bog, where cranberries are essentially being grown elsewhere in the country and in Canada, and it's no longer economically sustainable for many growers in Massachusetts. So for those that are opting to leave the industry, um, we developed a cranberry bog restoration program that makes that transition sustainable, economically sustainable for the grower, and also gives DER and partners an opportunity to restore those lands back to their native wetland condition. Um, and so that's an example of, a, of an economic trend that became evident and we were able to see that coming and to start a program to, um, uh, to take advantage of that transition and turn that into natural restored wetlands um, that are publicly accessible and have trails um, and other community benefits as well as the significant benefits to nature. And then finally, um, one of the most important pieces is that, you know, DER is part of state government. And so we also need to be able to demonstrate and to frame and to shift our work so that it is truly helping the administration to meet its own goals um, and program needs. And, um, and so for us over the last several years, that has meant really helping the administration understand how aquatic habitat restoration um, can truly help communities adapt to climate change. But there are many other benefits that restoration brings. And so um, a lot of our role is helping the administration understand that wide range of benefits and how those benefits relate to its policies. So where we are now is we are in the middle of an expansion process. And this is a unique and exciting opportunity for all of us that are in the division. It's extremely rare to have the opportunity to grow and build an environmental agency. So, um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about that expansion and where we're going from here. So there is a huge demand for DER's assistance. Um, far more landowners and municipalities apply to our programs 
then we are able to assist. And that, that demand continues to grow and will continue to grow um, as the climate continues to change, as people become even more aware of flooding and sea level rise um, and the benefits of these kinds of projects. So to meet that need, the commissioner of the Department of Fish and Game, which is our parent agency, um, asked our division to develop an expansion plan and to think about how we could grow the agency in order to better and more comprehensively meet the needs of our constituents. Our goal in thinking about this was really to ramp up restoration, to expand the pace and the scale of restoration across the Commonwealth. Over the last few years, we have seen our operational budget um, more than triple. We went from an operational budget that um, essentially could not support the 15 staff that we had at the time. Now our operational budget fully supports the, um, the staff that we have currently and will allow us to add more to bring us up to 32 staff, um, hopefully by the end of next fiscal year. That is due to support from, from the legislature, which in turn is hearing from our partners and NGOs and municipalities that these services are needed. We also have a capital budget, um, which is small, which we dedicate to our projects and our municipal culvert replacement grant program and use to leverage additional resources. Although it is small, it has tripled. Um, over the last few years with, with the most growth in fiscal year 22. So we're about partway through this expansion um, and we plan to continue to grow. And so when we look ahead, you know, this is really um, what we're looking at. And the, this is really the right time for our division to be expanding. There is significant unmet need um, as I was just saying, there is commitment to climate change adaptation at all levels now, both at the, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And resources are rapidly becoming available for this aquatic habitat restoration work because it builds resilience to climate change. So this funding is growing, but our towns and agencies and nonprofits need that sustained technical and financial assistance in order to bridge the capacity gap that they currently face. And that is where we come in. And so we are, first of all, expanding the pipeline of projects that we manage. Um, the new staff that we've been adding over the last couple of years and that we will be adding this year and next year are really helping us ramp up the numbers of restoration projects that are in planning and are heading into implementation. So we're ramping up our dam removal work and we're ramping up our work to bring increased resilience to our coastal salt marshes. In addition, we're ramping up our freshwater wetland restoration work um, with the goal of restoring around 1,000 acres um, over the next few years. Our municipal culvert grant program um, is seeking to expand as well. So we're, we're trying to build additional capital resources to support the culvert grant program. Next, we are taking the knowledge that we've gained through this work in the trenches with communities. And in the current, in the coming years, we'll be documenting and sharing the best practices and the tools and approaches that we've learned ourselves through hard experience over the last 14 years. We've accumulated a huge body of knowledge, um, everything from the nitty gritty of how to develop a effective engineering scope of work um, and construction technical specifications to best practices for community outreach and engagement. We're always learning, but now is the, really the time to get that knowledge out of our collective brains at DER and into the hands of people that need that information to get restoration work done. And so that means developing tools, trainings, manuals, and increasing the technical assistance um, that we provide 
to our partners. Third, we want to continue and to ramp up our efforts to build capacity at the local level to lead and support restoration and adaptation. So two years ago, we piloted, began piloting a new program to build the capacity of regional organizations to lead and support restoration. Um, I mentioned that earlier, we're providing staff resources um, and funding to those organizations so that they can hire restoration coordinators to help towns and others within their regions. So that's underway. We're currently working with three organizations across the state um, that each have um, a wide variety of municipalities and interested landowners within their regions. And they are going through a process of restoration planning and prioritization and moving into implementation. We'll continue to support those three partnerships and then we will add additional partnerships um, in the years to come. And our vision is that eventually, um, you know, these partnerships and regional organizations will cover the entire state so that no matter what town you're in, there is a regional partnership that is there to support your town in carrying out restoration projects. And that regional organization will take on that role of um, uh, gathering and um, assessing restoration projects, prioritizing those with the highest benefits for people in the environment, bringing the resources and helping to implement those projects. And then finally, um, we will continue to advocate for restoration in the state's approach to climate adaptation. There are a variety of state level planning efforts and policy efforts um, and state level grant programs, all of which um, benefit from having a restoration component. And so, um, and it, it takes staff time and, um, and capacity to engage in these state level policy efforts. But it's incredibly rewarding and successful to help our agency partners and our high level uh, secretariat um, level programs to understand how restoration can help those programs achieve their goals. So we will continue to advocate for restoration in the statewide policy landscape. So I want to close again um, by recognizing the incredible staff that we have at the Division of Ecological Restoration. Our staff are passionate and dedicated, and they inspire the communities and the landowners and the nonprofits that they work with to get restoration projects done. So in the last uh, 40 minutes, what I've covered is a little bit about ecological restoration and state government and how state government fits into restoration. One point that I wanna highlight is that in New England, people really look to state government to get involved in a hands-on way in leading and supporting restoration. I know from my own work experience in other parts of the country that there's plenty of places where um, state government can't play the kind of hands-on role that we play in Massachusetts. Where we are, people really want to see state government, you know, out in their communities and to see our staff, you know, visibly in communities working um, in the trenches with our partners. So I've talked about that quite a bit, how our division really takes that role, um, because that is the need that exists. I also touched on the, some of the lessons that we've learned and um, the methods that we use to sustain a state agency, really trying to make restoration a part of, you know, every day doing business across the Commonwealth and to help the community and state agencies and others see that restoration isn't just nice to have, it's something we need to have as the climate changes and, um, and to build community resilience. And then lastly, I talked a little bit about where we're going from here. And that includes really ramping up 
restoration through expanding our project management, but also ramping up our assistance to others so that other organizations can be leading and supporting restoration um, just as DER does now. So with that, um, I'd like to, um, I think just close with a couple bigger picture thoughts and then take questions. Um, so first, I think that in many ways, um, Massachusetts is, is in a bit of a unique position in taking this hands-on leadership role with restoration. Um, I know that many other states are also leading restoration, um, but there are very few state agencies that are dedicated to this kind of role. And my hope is that the work that we do and the way we have structured our division can potentially serve as a model for other state programs that are working in a similar sort of um, policy context that we're working in. And so we hope to serve as a resource to other states that would like to also launch a division of ecological restoration. And then um, second, another big picture thought, perhaps you know, more importantly, is that the benefits of restoration to people go beyond public safety and habitat and access to nature. There's a hope and optimism that comes with the rest restoration experience. The experience of working together with others of different backgrounds, different perspectives, different goals towards a common restoration vision, um, to seeing a vision for restoration on a river or wetland made real. And this kind of gut level knowledge that the actions that we're taking together truly make a difference in the environment and for people. And we're really at a point in society where we need those hopeful experiences. We need the skills of taking action in partnership to work towards common goals. And we need to believe and to take action knowing that our actions bear fruit. So um, with that, you know, and the knowledge that, that restoration is just incredibly exciting and rewarding uh, to be involved in, um, I'll stop here. And um, thank you very much for your attention and for being here today. And I look forward to um, taking any questions. Uh, thank you, Beth, that was great. Um, I really like kind of your, your closing message there. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I really love how you all are building that, that capacity with your partnership programs and everything along with the good work that you're doing. So um, a couple of minutes ago, I dropped in chat, hey, start dropping in your questions and man, did people respond. So thanks everyone for doing your questions in here and we'll start going through them. Um, if we don't get a chance to get through them all, um, Beth, um, if you're interested or, or willing, people can email you maybe directly with some of these questions if we don't get through them all. Yep, absolutely. Okay, super. So first one, um, to get state legislature funding approval, did you get a lot of vocal support from municipalities and others? If so, who? Um, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so in Massachusetts, we have the Massachusetts Municipal Association, which um, represents the needs and the interests of municipalities across the state. And so that is the organization that um, has advocated for, uh, for some of DER's work um, in the legislature, particularly the, the culvert work. Um, every town in Massachusetts has one or more failing culverts. And it's a huge need, you know, funding technical assistance is, is just desperately needed simply to keep the road network together. So the combination of the environmental benefits with those, um, you know, the public safety need has, um, is what has really brought uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Association to advocate for our work. Great. Um, all right, next one. What is your methodology for prioritizing culvert replacements and dam removal projects? Yeah, so um, we have a couple of, sort of desktop tools 
that allow us to get kind of a high level um, prioritization of projects. On our website, we have our restoration potential model for dams. And then there is also uh, a similar type of model, which you can find elsewhere. If you email me, I can send you links that looks at culverts. So we look at ecological benefit, you know, the, the desktop analyses that we have, they're just desktop. So we use that as sort of advisory. Um, and then we also look at benefits to people and those can be articulated in a variety of ways, whether it's public safety, uh, perhaps it's in an environmental justice neighborhood, perhaps there are strong education opportunities around the project. So we evaluate those also. In general though, environmentally, we're looking for places where the dam or the culvert is one of the primary stressors um, on the system. So that once you remove the dam, the river is otherwise in good health. That's kind of what we strive for. Um, in reality, you know, Massachusetts is a highly developed landscape and there are very few places where that is the case. So it's always kind of a matter of balancing the remaining stressors that we can't address through a barrier removal um, against the benefits of removing that barrier. Okay. <laughs> At some point, I feel like we're all gonna run out of the low hanging fruit, right? And uh, we'll get to some of those more complicated questions of project selection. Um, all right, let's see here. The next one here we have is, where do engineering consultants come to uh, play a role in your projects and how do they get involved with your projects? Yeah, so um, we work in partnership with engineering consultants to carry out engineering and design and sometimes permitting uh, for the projects as well as construction administration and uh, construction observation. So we don't have engineers in-house. Um, we use our sort of small capital budget to contract directly with engineering consultants to carry out those very phases, various phases of work. Um, and also our local partners may also contract directly with engineering consultants to carry out those phases. Um, our division has a master agreement that we open up every three to five years or so. And engin engineering firms can apply to be part of that master agreement. Um, the state as a whole is moving away from individual master agreements to more kind of generic master agreements. So you can also look at Massachusetts um, broader uh, master agreements. Um, they're on the state's website on a, in a database called Compass, which um, I can uh, share with you. Um, and so Anyway, once you apply to those for, to those master agreements, um, then DER is able to, to partner with you. Okay, great. Uh, did you run into state fiscal spending or award procedural roadblocks? If so, how did you overcome it for your program? Um, and this person says we've been trying, we've been trying in our state that a biological priority is on, is not on is not fair under our grant award rules. I think I'm not understanding the question. Could you read that again? Yeah, sure. I'll um, go back up. Did you run into state fiscal spending award procedures roadblocks? If so, how did you overcome it for your program? Mm -hmm. And that. Mm -hmm. So we have we have not. Um, we put. And I'm not sure I'm answering the question correctly, but we put out our own request for responses that describe the uh, evaluation criteria that we will be using to make awards. And so um, we have that kind of autonomy that allows us to do that. Okay. Uh, what percentage of projects are taking place on private land versus state, federal, municipal owned lands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's hard to say, you know, it, it kind of moves around, um, but we work, I would say, equally with private landowners. For example, we work with a lot of private dam owners um, and we work with a number of private 
uh, cranberry bog owners that are transitioning um, out of you know out of agriculture. And then we work with municipalities, particularly on coastal wetland restoration projects, um, but also on dam removals. So it's you know it's it's a mix. Okay, well, DER is not a regulatory agency. Is there a benefit to using DER standard details and specs when permitting frustration projects in Massachusetts? Um, or does it accelerated permit permitting if direct references to use of your resources? We don't have any standard specs or anything like that. Um, there is some accelerated permitting for ecological restoration projects, but they are independent of anything that DER um, might do. I mean, they're, they're not related to, we don't speak to them at all during the regulatory process, I guess is, is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a comment in here about somebody being very excited about your agency taking on true restoration, um, having grown up in Carlisle. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And uh, what it, and so that person also continues to say, what is the balance of remediation, uh, contamination cleanup, and restoration um, kind of ecological process? Mm -hmm. So um, let's see. When I think of remediation, I think of of cleanup of contaminants and things like that. So um, our division does not target those kinds of projects. However, when we think about restoring aquatic habitats, rivers and wetlands, um, often the dam removals that we're dealing with do have contaminants stored behind them. And so in that case, we would also be you know, handling and managing that contaminated sediment. But we don't um, take on sort of remediation projects as a class. Um, yeah. Okay, this will probably be our last one. Uh, we'll see how, how quickly you answer it, Beth. Uh, can, can you discuss the ER's leadership on more resilient road stream crossings in Massachusetts and adoption of the Massachusetts River and Stream Crossing Standards? Um, sure. I think whoever you are that's asking that, I must know you. Um, <laughs> I think you so, <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, conservation groups and agencies in Massachusetts have had a long-standing interest in improving road stream crossings, and that interest probably started in the early 2000s. Um, and it started with a desire to gain more information first. And so there were many years of assessing road stream crossings and discovering, you know, oh my gosh, most of our road stream crossings are going to be blocking fish or falling apart. Um, and from there, the next goal became, how do we develop, you know, so we know that these crossings are not working. How do we develop standards that will um, give guidance on what's better than what we have? And so UMass um, in particular took coordination leadership along with other organizations to develop those standards. Those were eventually codified into the state's wetlands regulations. So that now if you're upgrading a culvert, um, you need to meet the stream crossing standards. So it started with assessment, moved into these standards. And then the next phase, which is where we are now was like, okay, we know we've got a big problem with culverts. We know what would be better. Now we have to actually help people make the change on the ground. And so that's where we are now is helping municipalities to replace those undersized and failing culverts with those that meet the stream crossing standards. If they meet the stream crossing standards, then there's aquatic organism passage, there's wildlife passage, and the crossings are much more resilient to storms. So with around you know, 30,000 to 40,000 culverts, this is a long haul effort, but we're dedicated to really trying to change the way that, um, that we do business with road stream crossings. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I think we will stop there. There's uh, several more questions in chat. So uh, I'm dropping in Beth's email right now so that if um, anybody wants to email you directly, they can use that email since you said that was fine. Um, really appreciate your time today. Um, and everyone who's in the audience, appreciate you, you calling in, listening to our webinar series and asking great questions to our speakers. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Get in touch if you have questions.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Beth. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.